Pleistocene Epoch, which contains the famous colloquially known Ice Age, which we actually still live under today, was filled with many amazing animals, many that look essentially like scaled up versions of our contemporary wildlife, ranging from giant beavers to mega sized lions. There were, however, also animals that today don't have any modern analogues, not to say that those mentioned previously don't have their own quirks of their own, but by comparison, some of these animals were really something different. Among them were animals in the family of Felidae, the cats, which back during the Pleistocene had some very impressive members. Sabertooth cats were among them, and one of which, the subject of today's video, Homotherium, has become all the more well understood through a recent discovery which has shaken the scientific community. To gain a bit of background on these cats before getting into the recent finds, Homotherium were decently large animals, around the size of lions, with adults being just over a metre tall at the shoulder and weighing up to 200 kilograms. While they would have looked generally similar to living cats, they did have their differences, and a lot of that is explained by just how diverged they are from living cats. They belonged to the now completely extinct subfamily of Macerodontinae, which are defined by their robust frames and comparatively large canine teeth that made them such formidable predators, with them having diverged from living cats around 20 million years ago in the Miocene, with Homotherium themselves diverging from Smilodon, the other last surviving Sabertooth, two million years later, really showing that evolutionarily, they were very distinct animals. Because of this, they look quite different anatomically, having longer and more muscular necks, a shorter and more slight back alongside a short tail, as well as more thinly built forearms which had smaller and less retractable claws, that is with the exception of a massive dewclaw, with all of these features being indicative of the type of lifestyles they were likely living. These adaptations are all in line with Homotherium being pursuit predators, with their long limbs and less retractable claws allowing them to better grip the ground when they were running, as well as also being able to pursue their prey of large animals over long distances, something which makes them quite similar to hyenas and wolves. The interesting thing to note about their forelimbs is while proportionately large, along with their dewclaw, meaning that they were evidently capable grapplers, their comparative lack of strength and grasping ability meant that they were more limited in this regard than lions and some researchers have suggested that this was an ecological pressure that would have made them more likely to have been group hunters, to bring down the massive animals like mammoths and bison that they were known to target. Their adaptation for more open areas, as well as the high levels of competition that were present from other carnivores, whether they be from hyenas, bears or lions, would have also been pressure to live in groups, given they would have been better able to defend their kills, their territories and their cubs, which of course then has its advantage of being able to more consistently bring down larger animals for them to all feed on. All this and more is why Homotherium was some of the Pleistocene's most impressive wildlife, and I'll be sure to do a more in-depth video on them in the future. Now however is the time to finally get to the main subjects of this video, so with the preludes now out of the way, here's what has been just recently learned about them. In 2020, scientists unearthed the remains of a small animal preserved in permafrost on the banks of the Badurika River, which comprises the Indurka River Basin in northern Russia, with the specimen being determined through radiocarbon dating to be around 35,000 to 37,000 years old. The mummy contains the heads and the front part of the body being about 24 centimeters in length, with there being some incomplete pelvic bones with some femur and shin elements also being in the area. After an inspection of them, it was surprising to find that this was in fact a homotherium, and a cub at that, no more than three weeks old, and is amazing for so, so many reasons. First and foremost is that this is the first ever known saber-toothed cat mummy ever described, and is the first time in the whole history of paleontological research that the life appearance of an extinct mammal with no living analogues has been examined in such detail. Also, at just around three weeks old when they passed, they are also one of the youngest saber-toothed cat specimens known of, as well as being definitive proof that Homotherium survived in Eurasia right up until the end stages of the Pleistocene. Before this find, a single lower jaw recovered from the North Sea was the latest known specimen of Homotherium from the region, which dated to around 30 through 28,000 years in age. The thing was that because of where it was recovered, not being found with surrounding sediment to more sufficiently date it, the estimated date of these remains was contested and generally considered unreliable. Well, now with this little guy, while the jaw may still be a good deal older, this saber-toothed kitten proves that they were still roaming these areas of the world, where they were once thought to have been long gone, around 200,000 years prior. This tiny cat preserves much of their soft tissue and reveals a lot of interesting traits that were inferred to be there, but are now very much confirmed. When compared to a modern lion cub at the same age, starting with the heads, they were rather boofy, 
with them having quite a rounded snout in comparison and with an also wider nasal opening and a larger brain case, which quite clearly shows a clear adaptation to a colder climate, given that it means they were better able to take in and warm up surrounding air as they respired. They also appear to have an increased ability for a wider mouth gape, which is consistent with what is known with their jaw anatomy, as they needed to be able to open their jaws wider to better effectively use their large canine teeth. Their ears are also quite small and rounded, which is another adaptation which helps in conserving heat through a reduction in the surface area, something which is also seen in woolly mammoths, with them also having a neck that is twice as thick as that of the lion cub, which shows that even from an early age, homotherium really were built different. With their teeth, together with their canines, their lower incisors form a consistent, single arch row, which is in contrast to lions, with them also having a distinctive lower jaw flange, and their incisors also being elevated upwards in the jaw comparatively to the cheek teeth row, which is all very evidently indicative of Homotherium's distinctive jaw anatomy already being present even at such young ages. With their forelimbs, they were already very elongated when compared to modern lions, which would have helped them in traversing their snowy and rough environments as cubs, and then later being useful for when they pursued hunt as adults. Additionally, their paws were very rounded, being almost as wide as they are long, with their foot pads or toe beans being rather squarish than the typical oval shape seen in lions, as well as lacking a carpal pad. All of these adaptations are ones that are seen in animals that live in snowy terrain, with them essentially being able to function like snowshoes to get them where they need to go. Regarding their colour, the specimen is a reddish brown in colour overall, with them also having a lighter underside which I'll get into more detail on soon. What is worth noting is that the colour of this animal is likely not the exact colours they had in life, as thousands of years in permafrost can make quite a big difference to their appearance. This is due to two kinds of pigmentation in the hair of mammals, being eumelanin, which represents black or brown colours, and pheomelanin, which represents red. Eumelanin is not as resistant, and therefore is quicker to, and more likely to degrade, which is why many other mammals from across the world, in humans and other animals alike, take on more of a reddish tinge that they otherwise would not have had when they were alive. Essentially, the cub may well have had an appearance a little different than what we can see, but that is something that both could and should be investigated more. Getting to the other part of their coloration, they have a lighter underside which is a yellowish-white colour, with them also having an extra amount of fluff under their lower jaw. This has sparked a good deal of interest, as while this could just be an artefact of preservation, many artists, especially Hadari here, have depicted the idea of them having quite shaggy chins, perhaps even being used as some kind of display structure, though this is of course quite speculative. With all of this considered, we should also account for the fact that many cats change their overall colour and patterning over the course of their lives, some being more drastic than others, so the adult cats may well have had a look a good bit different, but that's up in the air as of now. Something else which has had some newfound attention on us is the Isterit statuettes which made by a Paleolithic artist from France, which has since been lost, could have either depicted a lynx, cave lion, or perhaps even a homotherium, which has been brought back up with increased scrutiny after this finding. The round heads, deep chin, and potentially short tail all seem to match up the latter on the surface, though this has been debated. The rather straight back seems quite unlike the posture a homotherium would exhibit, and even though the statuette has a short tail, which homotherium was known to have, this could well just be an artefact of preservation, and there may well have been a longer tail that was lost, or it just wasn't reconstructed due to how tricky it would have been to chisel. The large chin and proportionally large heads could also be interpreted as simply the artist taking into account a decent amount of hair that can be present on lion chins, giving them the impression of a larger one that isn't actually the case. The large head and eyes are also interesting in that proportionately, Homotherium, while having orbits larger in comparison to Smilodon, was still always relatively smaller than in lions or tigers, with the eyes of the sculpture being even bigger than an adult lion, a feature alongside the larger heads that may indicate that this statuette could well be depicting either a juvenile lion or a cub. This could well just be an art style choice, though it is worth noting that other Paleolithic depictions of adult lions, such as those from Chauver Cave at about the same time frame, also had eyes of the right proportionate size, which is something to very much consider. Altogether, this homotherium mummy has both confirmed many of our ideas about their life appearance, while also, as science works, brought up a whole bunch of new questions, and hopefully as time goes on, some of them at least can be resolved so that we can learn more about these fascinating cats. Homotherium was a wide-ranging genus when they were alive, being found across not just Eurasia, but also through to Africa and to the Americas, 
ranging all the way from Venezuela to Java over the millions of years they were around. And so, it makes sense that because of these ranges and timescales they live from, there were almost certainly unique traits to all of these populations that just unfortunately will never be known due to the uncertainty of the fossil record and preservation bias, especially as warmer and more humid areas are less conducive to mummies being formed. Yet, as the rates of permafrost melting increases as anthropogenic climate change continues, there are sure to be even more mummies waiting to be found out there, just waiting to be seen by the wider worlds once again. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.